Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We're going to talk about Tom, Dick, and Harry. I think that most of us would agree that uh, rewards in the life of the Christian, what we have to look forward to in the future, the judgment seat of Christ, uh, Bema, uh, rewards relate to service. Now I'm going to suggest at the outset of this that service equals a principle, a very important life principle, and that is not I, but Christ. If we can start on that basis, then I think that we're going to find out that the outcome of Bema may not have been quite as we thought it was. Uh, I think the outcome is startling. So I want to sort of share that with you here on this Wednesday, uh, Wednesday before Christmas. I believe this is the last Wednesday before Christmas. There is a casting of our crowns, uh, which is obviously a special act of worship. It's only going to happen once. It's never going to happen again. We today, even now, we worship God and we worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we know that truth is highly relevant when it comes to this entire subject of the believer's judgment at Bema. We know that Christ Himself is truth. So I don't see how we can separate truth from Bema. We are sanctified in truth. Thy word is truth. So I don't see how that we can separate God setting us apart for service from Bema. Now when we talk about truth, of course, we bring up the subject of doctrine. It's not a favorite topic among Christians today. But we hear or we read Paul writing to Timothy, Take heed unto doctrine, for in doing so thou shalt deliver thyself and them that hear thee. I'm going to suggest that from the outset, we need to look at Bema through the proper lens. 
And I think that lens involves many amazing, wonderful truths that are interwoven throughout the entire New Testament. We know that the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. We know that the Holy Spirit is our comforter. We know from Scripture that the Holy Spirit enlightens us to the truth of the Word of God. We know from Scripture that the Holy Spirit seals truth in the lives of believers in whom He has enlightened. We know that it runs like a golden thread throughout the entire New Testament that God is supremely sovereign. If we're not looking at Bema through the lens of God's sovereignty, His absolute sovereignty, I think we're going to miss the mark in understanding the true nature of Bema. God is sovereign. I also believe that, as Scripture says, that God remains faithful even if we are not. So we have God's faithfulness involved as it concerns those rewards at Bama. We know that what goes up in smoke, which is what, what's burned up at, at Bama, is that which is of the flesh, which came from the flesh, which stemmed from the flesh, in which the flesh was operating, in which there's no good thing. It is extremely important that we look at all this through the proper lens, and that lens being the Word of God. We know that the law was fulfilled in Christ. Christ came. He kept the law. We now have the very fullness of the triune God, and we have the, the, the one who fulfilled the law living in and through our lives. We know that we are speaking of the body of Christ when we talk about Bema. We know that, that we're looking at the body of Christ. This is particularly, a, this is a, an event which takes place which pertains only to the body of Christ. One body in which we are all members. We also know that the builder is God. One, one plants, one waters, but God causes the growth. Now I want you to keep that in mind as we talk about Harry. Now I've chose Tom, Dick, and Harry just, just to illustrate a few points. You know, Tom, he, he's got all five crowns. Dick, he's got a couple, but poor Harry, he, he, he doesn't have any. His entire life's work went up in smoke. Yet he himself was saved, yet so as through fire. I think the idea in the minds of many Christians is that Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, is somewhat of a scary event. I would suggest it's, a, it's going to be a, a somber event, but I would not interject the word fear into it at all. At all. We know that there is zero condemnation for every believer who attends the judgment seat of Christ. It is not an invite where that some 
may accept and attend, and some may decide to not accept the invitation and attend, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must also all be born again. And that word must, whether you're talking about we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ or you must be born again, this is the must of necessity, not the must of obligation. We have no choice in the matter. We must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And we have no choice in the matter. We must all be born again, but that's not the must of obligation. We are born again purely by the grace of God. We know that grace, the grace of God, cannot be separated or removed from that glorious day in which we are standing before Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. That grace at that point is not evaporated, but it continues on. We also know that we stand before God as righteous as Christ Himself, the righteousness that God imputed unto us, that Christ shares with us His life, His very life. He's given us His life. The new man cannot sin. The old man, that's all it does. And so we need to, to understand that that's part of that proper lens that we're looking through when we look at the judgment seat of Christ. We wanna, I want to I wanna talk a, a little bit about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the one foundation which we build upon, which is Christ. I want to remind you that it is the, a man's entire life's work singular, not works plural, that's judged at Bema. That's a highly relevant point. Most, I think many Christians get the idea that, that it's works plural. It's not. It is work singular. It's how we built on the one foundation, which is Christ. That's first. Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 puts us in the context of that. Interestingly, if you go to Revelation 3.11, we, we also uh, see that we are to hold fast to that which we have because Christ is coming soon. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast to that, that which thou hast. Let no man... Take thy crown. So, a man can take your crown. Well, how, how would he take your crown? Well, it's, it's obvious that the only, re the only way that um, any man could possibly take your crown, and the text says that he can, is through false teaching. Is to lead you into error or that you adopt that error in your life and nothing, no, nothing good comes from it. We know from John chapter 15 that He's the vine, that we're the branches, that apart from Him we can do nothing, that He produces through us what we cannot in the flesh produce in and of ourselves. The, folks, these are most important truths that govern our lives as Christians, but really shed a lot of light on the judgment seat of Christ and understanding the judgment seat of Christ. He's the vine, we're the branch. Dearly beloved, humans cannot produce the divine. What remains is what Christ did in and through us, not what we do for Christ or what we did for Christ. Oh, but Steve, now what about responsibility? You, you, you can talk, we can talk about God's sovereignty all day long. We can talk about God's will over our lives all day long. 
It is God who is at work in us, both to will and do of His good pleasure. So Steve, where does responsibility come into all this? Obligation, accountability, responsibility. Well, I can assure you that that responsibility is in no way whatsoever associated with the flesh. Of course, we have a responsibility. We have an obligation to walk according to truth. Our responsibility as Christians is not in keeping the law. We're not under the law. We've died to the law in order that we might live unto God. Our responsibility is very real, but it, that responsibility, dearly beloved, is associated with a walk according to grace. We are obligated in that sense. We are to abide in Him, John 15. Him, he's the vine, we're the, br the branches. We're to rest in Him, Hebrews chapter 4. We're to trust in Him, every other verse throughout the New Testament. And that is personal faith. Personal faith, dearly beloved, your faith, my faith in God. That faith was a gift. By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. When we talk about our personal faith, we're talking about trusting our ability to trust in the one who is faithful. Okay? We're not always going to be faithful. But, praise God, He's faithful even when we're not. Even when we're not. Because He cannot deny Himself. We're trusting in the One who is faithful, not ourselves. Trusting in ourselves. If you're a Christian going through this life, trusting in yourself, trusting in your own self, your own abilities, your own talents, your own skills, your own whatever. Bama is going to bear that out. So I just want you to know here that and be reminded of the fact that we cannot separate sound biblical doctrine from the judgment seat of Christ. We can't separate truth from it. We are to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Jude uh, chapter 1, verse 3. It's the faith that we contend earnestly for. It's articulated it's not faith, it's the faith. There is a particular faith, and that faith is trusting in the one who is faithful. That faith is not trusting in ourselves. Now, the Bible mentions rewards in heaven multiple times in Matthew 5, Luke 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 3. But why are rewards necessary? I mean, won't being in heaven you know, would God be enough? Won't that be enough? Experiencing Him, uh, His glory, and the joys of heaven, you know, it'll be so wonderful, it's hard to understand why extra rewards would even be needed. Also, since our faith rests in Christ's righteousness instead of our own, Romans chapter 3, it seems strange that our works would merit reward. But since it's not our works to begin with, I submit that in a momentous act of true worship, we give credit where credit's due. Isn't that what we ought to be always doing now? Right now. If, 
if by casting our crowns at his feet is giving credit where credit's due, then tell me, dearly beloved, please tell me, how is that so different than what we are to, to do now? Isn't that what we do now? Isn't that what we want to do? Isn't that what we should do? Should we not be giving God credit where credit is due? And I'm going to submit to you that that covers just about every area of our lives. Folks, there is not one, if you are a born again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is not one thing you possess that you were not given by grace. Not one. Not one. There, God never gave you anything based upon what you did. That's works. That's, that's an entire different system. That's, this is what sets Christianity apart from every other religion. That it is not by works, lest any man should boast. God will give rewards in heaven at Bama or the judgment seat of Christ based upon our faithfulness in service to Him. That is true, but we're not under law. And you have to keep that in your mind as you go forward and trying to understand, and this thing keeps getting in my way, as, as, you, as, we, as we begin to look at Bema, we can't just rush into Bema with some, a lot of misguided notions as, as to how we performed here in this life. We, we, it all must be filtered through the truth of the Word of God. It is, it is certainly not a subject that we discuss in grave, frightening terms. There's nothing going to be scary. Nothing scary about Bama, folks. Nothing. Okay? Now, if we were talking about the great white throne judgment, it'd be a different story. The rewards at Bama will show the reality of our sonship, Galatians chapter 4, It'll show the justice of God, Hebrews chapter 6. God will give rewards in heaven in order to fulfill the law of sowing and reaping, Galatians 6, and make good on His promise that our labor in the Lord is not, was not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15. So Jesus basically shares His reward with us. Paul said, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith, by the faith of, not in, look at your Greek, by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Galatians 2.20 Our lives are hidden with Christ who is seated at the right hand of God. Colossians chapter 3. We died with Him. We live with Him. We share in His joy. In heaven, we'll dwell with Him. Our lives are inextricably linked with Christ's. The reward He receives is shared with all of us. If we are children, then we are heirs. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ since indeed we share in His sufferings it's not if we share in His sufferings. We're going to share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. Romans chapter 8. Our rewards in heaven depend on the goodness and the power of God. I believe it also depends upon the needs of the body, folks. You know, poor old Harry, he didn't have any, any crowns. He didn't have any rewards. Well, someone had to be the recipient of the ministry. Someone had to be on the receiving end of, of, that, of the teaching. Someone had to... You, you, I don't know how to really put that, this into words, but uh, here's, here's poor Harry. Didn't get any... His whole entire life's work went up in smoke. And here you got Tom 
Tom, he, he got all five crowns. Well, how in the world is Harry going to feel? I hope to shed some light on this. I, I really do. I truly do. Through Christ's resurrection, we gain an inheritance in heaven. On earth, our faith is tested and it results in praise and glory and honor when Christ is revealed. That's 1 Peter 1. After we are tested, we shall come forth as gold. But the things that we do in this life are only permanent if they are built on that one foundation, which is Jesus Christ. You know, I've done videos on Bama before. You know, we're looking at the judgment seat of Christ in which an entire life's, a man's entire life's work singular is burned up, yet he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, which mentions it, it contrasts gold, silver, precious stones with wood, hay, and stubble. And I've, I've suggested to you folks that uh, we're not looking at uh, six things there. We're looking at two groups of three things, of, of, well, we're looking at two things. Two things. One, gold, silver, precious stone. That's one thing. Wood, hay, and stubble. That's another. So it's two groups of three things rather than six things. You know, a child who wins a, a spelling bee, you know, treasures the trophy that he receives, not for the sake of the trophy itself, but for what that trophy means. And likewise, any rewards or honor that we gain in heaven will be, will be precious to us because they carry the weight and the meaning of our relationship with God and because they remind us of what He did through us here on earth. And in this way, rewards in heaven glorify God and provide us with joy, peace, and wonder as we consider God's work in us and through us. The closer we were to God, during this life, the more centered on Him and aware of Him, the more dependent on Him, the more desperate for His mercy, the more th there will be to celebrate. We are, we're like characters in a story who, who suffer doubt, loss, and, and fear, wondering if we'll ever really have our heart's desire. When the happy ending comes and desire is fulfilled, there comes a completion. The story wouldn't be satisfying without that completion. Rewards in heaven are the completion of our earthly story and those rewards will be eternally satisfying. Psalms chapter 16. But, dearly beloved, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The human cannot produce the divine. You know, for the saints to cast their crowns before the throne of God is to publicly acknowledge Christ's right and His alone to wear those crowns. And at this time, they'll give credit where credit is due. During their lives, these believers had faithfully represented Christ in the world in accordance with truth. Truth. You know, it was that truth that produces, produced both godly character and service. But that ability to do so had not been generated by our own will and power, but instead by the will and the power of God. The will and the power of God. We're looking at the will and the power of God. Not, not our will and our power, our strength. Paul said, I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. That's what Paul said. Are you, are you willing to say the same? That, that Say, I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. Are you willing to do that? 
I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. Romans chapter 15. So Harry's entire life's work burned up, goes up in smoke. Does he have a crown or crowns to cast at Jesus' feet? Seems on the surface that he wouldn't. His entire life's work. I mean, how could he how could he possess even one of those five crowns? Well, in Revelation chapter four, we see the twenty-four elders before which half of those twenty-four elders, twelve of them, represent the church. Uh now, many, many have a different view on that. Many, some believe that all 24 represent the church. I, I, I'm going to suggest that, that, that 12 represent Israel, 12 represent the church. But nevertheless, uh, these elders before the throne cast their crowns at Jesus' feet and because He's worthy, and I believe if you, if you, as I do, if you look at those 24, those elders as representing the church, you can't disclude or not include Harry among them. That's what I'm going to suggest. Harry's not out on some limb here. You know, where, where he's, he's standing there at the judgment seat of Christ and rewards are being given, uh, you know, Tom got all five. Harry, he got three. Poor old Harry, he didn't get any. So he's kind of left out. He's put out. Dearly beloved, please, please, I, I beseech you, stop for a moment and give this some thought. The same ones the same God who, who work, was working in Tom and Dick's life is worked in Harry's. Harry belonged to Christ or he wouldn't be there. God didn't work in, in some different way in Harry's life. Now, most surely, we don't deserve the credit for these crowns. We'll cast them before the throne of God because that honor rightfully belongs to Him, to the One who called us to into His service, who equipped us with everything we needed to fulfill that calling, who accomplished through us what we could not do ourselves, and who rewarded us with eternal life and with words of praise. Each man's praise shall come to him from God, the text says. 1 Corinthians 3. Each man's praise will come to him from God. Does that include Harry? Or is Harry left out? With positions of authority within his eternal kingdom, with, with the capacities to shine forth the blazing glory of God, every saint, including Harry, I'm not sure we should really Look at Harry as just poor old Harry. Now I will concede to the fact that he will suffer loss. The text says he suffers loss. That's true. I don't think that loss is permanent. I don't think that's going to last very long. He dries our tears. He wipes away our tears. There is no more pain, no more sorrow, no more regret, no none of that. Harry's not going to go into eternity and live throughout eternity feeling slighted. That's, that's what I'm going to suggest to you. I, now, you may be of a different mind as, as that, and if you are, that's fine, but I can't, I can't, I can't see that with poor Harry. When the saints cast their crowns before the throne of Christ, their declaration is, you and you alone deserve to wear these crowns. Jesus Christ deserves all the glory 
for our crowns. Why? Because he, of the work He did in our lives. What work did He do in Harry's life? Did He not do any in Harry's life? Was there not anything praiseworthy in Harry's life? Well, of course there was. The saints cast their crowns before the throne of God as an act of worship because the work was not really theirs, but His. You know, and when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, to Him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and will worship Him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are You, o our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. Revelation chapter 4. So with this one act, the saints are declaring the worth of the generous one who is so willing to share his life, his praise, his authority, and his glory with those who belong to him. Harry's entire life's work may go up in flames, but what remains is pure gold. Not just for Tom and Dick, but Harry. Those who submitted themselves to his rule over their lives. His rule. His rule. Did you get that? I submit Harry did that. I submit that Harry committed his life to Christ to govern his life. And Christ did just that. I have no, I have no right folks, to misdirect you, to lead you off into some area in which God's not working in your life. Lead you away from an area which God is working in your life. Because I think that that's what you need. I have no right to do that. How do I know how God's working in your life? But He is. And that's, that work that He is doing is, is consistent. God never goes on vacation. He never takes a break. So I submit Harry did that. And, and that's how God used Harry. That's how God used him. And Harry's going to come to realize that. It's not about Harry not getting what he wished. Well, I wished I'd got all five crowns. Nor is it about Harry getting what his poor backside deserved. Well, you know, poor guy, poor guy he just got what he deserved. But it's about Harry knowing that what he got, listen to me, that what he got, or in his case didn't get, was nothing less than what God willed for Harry. Can you imagine that? Is it, do you find it that difficult to imagine that this is what God willed for Harry? This is the kind of God we serve. 1 Timothy 1.7, now 1.17, now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Dearly beloved, abide in Him. You know, Christian doctrines are, are such that they could not naturally command success. You know, it's what sets Christianity apart from all other religions. It makes promises which are seemingly incredible, which cannot be realized or obtained through self-effort because they're founded on the miracle of the resurrection of Christ and our being raised with Christ. And to seal the faith against self, it promised persecutions. I hope I've shed some light on this. I, I think that we are looking for our, we are we are seeing without a doubt, at least in my mind, we're seeing without a doubt some real signs of our Lord's near return. And when He comes back for us, we will stand before Him without spot, blameless, clothed in 
the white, the fine white linen of his righteousness. That includes Harry. So, in closing, if your name's Harry out there, I uh, hope you didn't take any offense at this. I had to come up with something. I could, I could have, I guess I could have said Tom, Dick, and Steve. But anyway, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.